Okay, we have lesson 23. We're going to start with chapter 1 of the Hatha Yoga Pratipika. We've talked a lot more about yoga, its origins, and its purpose will become clear. Very interesting story. Chapter 1, Sutra 1. I salute the primeval Lord Shiva, who taught Parvati the Hatha Yoga Vidya, which is as a stairway for those who wish to attain the lofty Raja Yoga. <clears throat> this is an evocation. Compared to modern times, in ancient times, there was no commercial motive behind almost everything that we do. So, Svatmarama does not start the book by introducing himself and emphasizing his, uh, his qualifications. He makes a direct link with, here it's God Shiva, so with the divine, but the purpose has nothing to do with religion. It's about asking for inspiration. So he he's very humble, controlling ego. He's not even claiming to be the author of the book. He's just a medium. He passes on the knowledge that he receives through inspiration from above. The story of Shiva teaching Parvati the Hatha Yoga Vidya, which is the science, Vidya, of Sun Moon. Hatha Yoga is, is the science of harmony between Shiva and Shakti energy, between plus and minus, between yin and yang. We talked about that last week extensively. I think that is clear. But the story of these are gods, these are not people. So every, every culture has a story about how the world came into being, how mankind came into existence. In Korea, that is the story of Tangun. Tangun is a mythological being that is, seems to be the first human being. Here, it's not Shiva or Parvati, it's Matsya, the fish. The story goes that Shiva was teaching Parvati yoga, Hatha yoga, on the beach in a place that is modern day Sri Lanka. There was a fish that came to the service and by chance overheard those teachings divine teachings, the teachings from a god to his wife, Parvati. Not human beings, I emphasize. This fish became Machendra, the king. Because of the knowledge he acquired by overhearing the teachings of Shiva, Lord Shiva or God Shiva to his wife, Parvati, he evolved, he grew, he developed. He became empowered and he became king. Not only that, he became, as story goes, the first human being. Now, this is very interesting because it shows that ancient people, without the benefit of sophisticated, sophisticated scientific instruments that we have, they had some idea that life originated in the sea. Now we know that for sure, with all our sophisticated tools that we have at our disposal. Ancient people didn't have that. All they had was their power of contemplation. So those ancient people had a quite clear idea that life, based on this story, the story clearly tells us that life came from the sea. The first human being was originally a fish. He became human by starting to practice yoga. Conditioned, cultivated, evolving into 
becoming the very first human being. Very interesting story. Not only that, huh? everything that we call divine, this is divine. This is a divine book, holy book. Last week, I spoiled maybe your enchantment with divinity and religion by bringing it down to very practical insight. So we talked about the holy cows of India, the evil pigs in Islam, and what have you. I hope that you can now from now on see through this lens in which you understand the practical purpose of labeling things divine. You know that Moses went up the mountain for 40 days. For 40 days he fasted and meditated. When he came down, he was carrying two tablets, or so the story goes, with yamas and niyamas. Of course, we call them the Ten Commandments, but this is no different than the yamas and the niyamas. What did he say to his people? God appeared before me, and he ordered me to write this down and bring it to my people. You think that is really what happened? You think that is really what happened? Try to bring it down to human level. Moses was a leader of a band of unruly people that were constantly fighting with each other. And he, someday, in desperation, he went up the mountain to connect with his heart. He stayed there for 40 days, or so the story goes. It can be 20, it can be 50. But he stayed there for 40 days and contemplated very deeply how can I unify my people? How can I stop the infighting, the useless and destructive fighting among our own tribe? And he decided that they need to live by a certain set of rules. But in his contemplations, he realized that if he said, these are my rules, and from today you have to start living according to these rules, he realized people would never obey that. So he said, these are not my rules, it's God who dictated them to me. These are divine rules. And it is a sin if you don't obey. If it's a sin if you violate these rules. That is why we we name things divine. You understand how this works? There is a reason why in industrialized countries that have a very well organized education system, churches are more and more empty. And in Holland, in the Netherlands, Many churches either have been demolished or they have been converted into something else. Like a shopping mall or a, a, a bazaar or... Why? Because people, since recently, have become very rational. And although they do not exactly understand religion, they think it doesn't make sense. They do not understand the practical background as we try to see. So they become suspicious. Conspiracy theories and what have you. And they stay away from church. They don't believe it anymore, the stories. But the, the, there is a very clear reason behind this. It is to stop the wars, the fighting. It is to stop people from functioning on impulses and, 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 and lower emotions and desires and ego. Society that succeeds to do so starts to thrive. Moses was the leader of the Jewish people. The Jewish people are very successful all over the world and that finds its origin thousands of years ago when they started to organize themselves. 
industrialized countries that have a high level of um, health, wealth, education, are countries where they have done exactly the same. And it starts with education. Countries where there is no organization, you see still people fighting with each other, among each other. So the purpose of religion, the purpose of naming things divine, is to organize people. To, like in the case with the holy cow from India, or other holy uh, things or beings, the purpose of calling it divine is to emphasize its importance. The holy river, the Ganges and the Yamuna, holy rivers, why are they holy? It's because they bring life. We can't live without water. The fish, all the nutrients that they, they bring every year when the river floods and, and, and covers the fields with, with very fertile mud, so we call it holy. The mountains are holy. The spirits of the mountains. Everything, basically, that is important in sustaining human life is attached to some kind of god. The god of the sun, the god of the moon, the god of the forest, the god of the rain, the god... Everything has a god, basically. The purpose is practical. Please respect the river, the mountain, the forest. This is important. Also important in this first sutra is the link that he makes with Raja Yoga. Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga are one. Hatha Yoga is a stairway towards the lofty Raja Yoga. It is a tool. Now how do you define Hatha Yoga, Raja Yoga? For that you can look at the book the Hatha Yoga Pradipika and the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. The Hatha Yoga Pradipika is a very practical foundation that can help you to start practicing yoga. Starting with giving some uh, uh, basic uh, uh, information about, about how to create the proper environment in which to practice. About about diet that is beneficial to, towards your yoga practice. And, and then it starts presenting exercises in a very systematic way, starting with physical exercises, then mental exercises, energy control exercises, increasing in sophistication and power. Try to read the book of Patanjali, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, and you will get lost from Sutra 1, Chapter 1. Because there are no exercises described in a practical way in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. It's very philosophical. The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali builds on the development, the foundation that you have established with Hatha Yoga, which is your ability to contemplate. To understand that, you must know that the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali exist only out of 199 sutras, 199 verses, which he wrote in a very austere way, using the least number of words possible. Some sutras exist only out of three words. He wrote those 199 sutras on one single banana leaf. But if you buy a book that translates and interprets the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, what do you get? You get a work this thick, 400 or more than 400 pages, to try to explain what Patanjali tried to convey on one banana leaf. I challenge you to read that book. 
I say that with a smile because I know you will go nowhere. That book and other books have been translated by academics, often people without experience, practical experience with yoga. So when you read a book like that, you get very long-winded academic explanations, very theoretical, about what Patanjali tried to convey. While what he really tried to convey is very practical. It's about yourself. It's about your place in the world. It's about the world as a whole. But it's especially, it's psychology of the human being in a very practical way. The purpose of the sutras is that you read one sutra and then just close your eyes and meditate on it. Throughout the years that I have taught, I noticed, and this is exactly expected to go this way, that every time I teach, I teach, I tell a different story. Why? Because the story evolves, because the insight deepens. And daily life experiences leads to more insight into those philosophical texts. That is the power of contemplation. So Raja Yoga is simply building on Hatha Yoga. How? By employing the power of contemplation that you have developed through the Hatha Yoga practice. So Raja Yoga Hatha. There is only one yoga. If you've been to the introduction workshop, you remember this. I ask, how many yogas are there? Because it seems that there are many. But in the end, there is only one. It exists out of Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga. The practical part and the philosophical part. All those variations of yoga that we have created are all products from later ages. Especially in the past 25 years, many of them have been created. Okay, Sutra 2. Svaparama Yogin, having saluted his Lord and Guru, teaches the Hatha Yoga Vidya solely for the attainment of Raja Yoga. Here you have it again. There's not so much that I can add to this. I have explained it already. Raja Yoga needs a stairway to get there, which is Hatha Yoga. Through Hatha Yoga, you condition yourself, allowing you to the power of contemplation. You become a holy person as a result. You become a natural scientist as a result, you become wise, insightful, a visionary, very naturally. And often these developments take place before you even know it, before you even realize it. Third Sutra. To those who wander in the darkness of conflicting doctrines, being ignorant of Raja Yoga, the most compassionate Svatmarama yogi offers the light of Hatha Vidya. To those who wander in the darkness of conflicting doctrines, the world is filled with conflicting doctrines, deluding people. People who are in the darkness of conflicting doctrines are, of course, people who have, who are lacking the power of contemplation, which means, in modern day language, who are lacking the power to think for themselves, to be skeptical and critical about information that they 
are absorbing. This shows that Svatmanama is not writing this book to, to prop up his ego, to take credit for writing an epic work. He's writing this book out of compassion. He sees what goes wrong with mankind if they remain unconditioned. And he decided to very syst systematically write down what can be done about that ignorance, that is that condition we call ignorance, which is the opposite of wisdom, knowing, vision, intuition. Ignorance, which has a negative connotation for native English speakers, but it is the opposite of knowing. It, it comes from the Greek word gnosos, which is knowing. Ignosos is not knowing. And in spite of all the education that we have, many people are still ignorant. Because if education is limited to mental level, it can mean that the crown chakra, where wisdom intuition, vision is located, is still not activated. To understand that, you can see the division in Europe and America, where half of the people does indeed live, live in a condition or in a world of conflicting doctrines, and another half is relatively enlightened. But all of them have been educated to some extent. That shows that half has, to some extent, functioning of the crown chakra. The other half is lacking the functioning of the crown chakra. At the time that Svatmarama wrote this book, many more people, there was, it was not half-half, there were many more people who were in that condition of not functioning crown chakra. And his only purpose to write this down and present it to the people is to help people reach enlightenment. Which for many people sounds very mysterious, but enlightenment is really to turn on the light. Eventually, in the long term, only the past couple of hundred years, 500 years, this has evolved into the education system as we have it today. Which, if you understand this, has overshot the goal. Because the intention of education was exactly this what Svatmarama meant to achieve with this book. But then it became too mental. Focusing on doing your exams, focusing on road, road memorization, Initially, the, the purpose of education was to enlighten the uneducated masses that were living in the darkness of conflicting doctrines, like Svatmarama. So it has evolved enormously since the book was written. We just have to bring it back down to its purpose. Open up the crown chakra so that you become your own. You become an academic on your own in your own might, not by memorizing books about subjects that you're not interested in, but by naturally contemplating issues that you feel drawn to. An education that you have had makes it easier for me to teach yoga, and it makes you, for you, it makes it possible to skip a huge uh, uh, a huge stage of development that otherwise should have been achieved through the practice of yoga. That's already been done since you, since you were born, basically. You have been subjected to two decades, two and a half decades of, of, of compulsory education. Have you ever wondered why your government wants you to be in school? 
in the Netherlands, I don't know about other countries, in the Netherlands, if your parents keep you from school, they will be fined. It's against the law. And if they persist, eventually they will end up in jail. So education is compulsory, it's an obligation. Why? Why is this so important for the government that they will throw your parents in jail eventually if they keep you out of school? Because it is important to have law and order, to have people cultivated to a point that they cooperate with the society that they are part of instead of working against it and causing chaos. Four, five, and all the way down to Sutra 9. We will do that in one stretch. Four Sutra, Machendra. Remember, Machendra is the fish that learned Hatha Yoga from the god Shiva. Machendra, Goraksha, and others knew well the Hatha Vidya. The yogin Swatmarama learned it by their favor. This is an interesting jump that he makes here. Because Swatmarama is now introducing himself as an authority. And he does that by referring to the lineage to which he belongs. And he belongs to the origin or the original lineage of yoga that started with Machendra, the fish that became the first human being. And then he goes on. Sutra 5 to 9. Shiva, Machendra, Shabara, Ananda Bhairava, Kaurangi, Bina, Goraksha, Virupaksha, Bilashaya, Mantana, Bhairava, Siddhi, Buddha, Kantari, Korantaka, Surananda, Siddhapada, Karpati, Kaneri, Pujapada, Nichanata, Niranjana, Kapalin, Bindunata, Kaka Kandishvara, Alama, Prabhudeva, Godakoli, Tintini, Banuki, Naradeva, Kanda, Kapalika, and many other great Siddhas, having conquered time by the power of Hatha Yoga, moved about the universe. Why would he do this? He is establishing the lineage to which he belongs. These are all great yogis, siddhis, holy yogis. Sometimes people ask, to what lineage do we belong? If that is being asked of you, if you ever start teaching yoga, a little bit beyond just physical exercise, if people ask, sometimes people do because they know a little bit about yoga, your answer should be Patanjali. We are of the lineage of Patanjali. So, all these saints that are mentioned here, all these great yogis that are mentioned here, according to the sutras, have conquered time. What does that mean, to conquer time? <clears throat> Some people think that this implies that you become immortal physically. Some people imply that 
Some people think that this implies that it means you can, you can fly, you can travel through the universe, through space. You become the master of the universe, as other sutras tell us. The reality is very practical. I was born in the 60s. I grew up in the 60s, 70s. Many of you were born in the 80s, 90s even. Although there is only 20 years difference there, or 25, maybe 30 years difference there, you function very differently from how I function. In the same way that my parents, who were born in the 30s, function totally different from the way I and my siblings function. Do you recognize that? That is what this means. When you practice yoga continuously, we are talking here about siddhas, people who have reached the highest stages of development in yoga. You free yourself from the conditioning that has taken place in your developmental stages. You will not change, but your insight will change. You will not change, but the way that you judge the world around you and the people in it will change. You become a universal human being. You can understand how a person would have functioned, at least to some extent, how a person would, would have functioned 300 years ago. Because you're able to think out of the box. That is what conquering time means. My mom was born in the 30s, experienced the Second World War it still determines her behavior 70, 80 years later. The way she thinks, the way she interprets the world around her and the people that she comes across. Under the influence of yoga, that trauma from the war would still exist but she would rise above it, allowing her to see the present instead of looking at the present through the prism of an experience of 60, 70 years ago. That is what this means. And that's something that you do in a contemplative state. That is a quality that all of you will gradually develop. And this is also a very interesting part. They move about the universe. Not on a magic carpet. Symbolically, especially in the Middle East, you can see religious paintings of a holy person, it's usually a male, a holy man sitting on a carpet flying through the sky. That is, of course, symbolism. So what does it mean, moving about the universe? Those people have died, at least physically. This is about reincarnation. According to Buddhism, we reincarnate one million times because we are ignorant. We keep making the same mistakes again and again. So we have to come back again and again. Our karma dictates that we must relive our mistakes until we finally start learning something from it. The purpose of a practice like Buddhism, yoga, and basically all other all other spiritual practices is to 
significantly reduce those one million lives. You literally awaken. And therefore, you start finally to learn from your mistakes. In the end, when you have reached liberation, when you have reached enlightenment, you don't reincarnate anymore. Then where do you go? Where does your spirit go? A normal human being, you know, when a, when a body dies, the spirit rises up. Right? Everybody knows that. That spirit rises up and reincarnates again at some point in time. The more sattvic you are, the more, listen, listen carefully, the more sattvic you are when you die, the longer it takes before you reincarnate. The more violent your death, the more the faster you reincarnate. Can you see a pattern here? After every war, there is a baby boom. You can explain that in all kinds of ways, but from our perspective, it makes total sense. Many people die from, many people die in a total unharmonious condition either by violence or other forms of suffering. Spirits that die abruptly, prematurely, by violence, are restless and therefore very quickly reincarnate. If you think that is far-fetched, you can clearly see the opposite too. We talk about graying societies. Japan is a graying society. European countries are graying societies. Many people die in peace. Of course, we have many ways to explain it away in other ways, in economical ways. But from our point of view, it makes total sense. When a society is very stable, the spirits of the people that die in those societies take a much longer time to return. That's one thing. Now, those that are mentioned here before, they don't return anymore. They move about the universe. The idea is that those people that have reach the highest levels of evolution, have become saints. They are up there. And they guide you. They move about the universe, and when you need them, they are there to guide you, to give you insight to support you. But they can only do that if you connect with them. And since we are living in the darkness of conflicting doctrines, we are blind. We only see what's right in front of us, our material world. And all they can do up there is shake their head in disbelief. And they think, well, if you don't want to listen to what I can show you, my insights, then you will have to suffer more. Buddhism is based on this idea. Mankind is suffering. Life is a valley of tears from birth until, that, until death. The whole idea of Buddhism Yoga is to end the suffering.
Most people that are suffering do not realize that they are suffering. We just think it's life. And you fight a little bit more with your family members, your siblings, or your neighbors, or your colleagues, because you think that's part of how you have to function, or how you have to take care of yourself, or stand up for yourself, and, and conflict after conflict, and, and we think that the better we can, we can, the harder we can fight, the more successful we will be. If you close your eyes, and you open your heart, they give you insight. Strange story, huh? But I firmly believe this myself, as I have found all my answers to all my conflicts by closing my eyes, by being humble, honest with myself, about myself, and not blaming anybody else for my suffering. I can blame my family, my parents, my, my society where I was born, my, the Second World War, I can, blame, I can blame so many, but it doesn't work, does it? You will just keep complaining the rest of your life. God helps only those who help themselves. They are there, waiting for you to open up. And one of the most rational people you will meet, atheist, and I'm pouring a bucket of cold water over you where it comes to religion. And yet here I am telling you about holy beings that are up there, that are just waiting there for you to open up so that they can guide you. That is the power of the crown chakra. That is why Swatmarama at the beginning of the book invokes. He asks for insight from God Shiva, Lord Shiva. He doesn't say, I have three degrees in philosophy and, and, and uh, what have you, and now I'm going to put my expertise to work in writing this book. No, he says, please help me to make this work for mankind. Not for me, not to make money, to help mankind. And he does that by opening up, ask for inspiration. And it is so simple. And the practice of yoga is designed to create that condition in you to do that. <coughs> I think you have noticed since you started this course that you more and more value appreciate time alone and silence. You turn on the music and then you think, ah, no, let's turn it off again. You just want to be in silence. That is because of this. Because yoga does connect you with the voice of your heart. And it is in those moments of silence just doing nothing, staring at the ceiling or out of the window, that you have your greatest insights. That you solve your biggest problems. You recognize this? We use many big words, but it's very simple. And it can only happen in silence. The 10th Sutra basically tells you what I've tried to tell you in this explanation. 10th Sutra, the Hatha Yoga is a sheltering monastery for those scorched by all the three types of pain. To those engaged in the practice of every kind of yoga, Hatha Yoga is like the tortoise that supports The world has been added later 
that supports that supports you. Hatha Yoga is a sheltering monastery for those scorched by all types of pain. Now when you think of pain, you think of what you, what you feel when you bump your head into the doorpost. Or when you cook and you're accidentally cutting your finger and it hurts. Maybe you think of pain when you have, when you break up with your partner and you're you're hurt. But these kind of pain are very obvious. And it's only a small percentage of all the pains that we that we know but do not realize exist. In yoga philosophy, pain can be super subtle. In fact, you can say if there is no sattva, if there is the slightest bit of disharmony, it's considered pain. So between that, which is imperceptible, and the very obvious kinds of pain, there is so many dimensions in between. And we need to start paying attention. We need to stop functioning based on impulses. We are disturbed by something, and without giving it a second thought, we simply act and react based on impulses. So something happens causing a wave. Our action, reaction based on impulse, just perpetuates the wave or makes it even bigger. And we think that is life because we don't know better. We think we have to act and react because we even think that we are weak if we don't act or react. But often the most courageous act is not to act at all and simply try to understand the law of cause and effect that is at work in that what is happening with you. Try to understand how you ended up in that situation that caused the disruption, the conflict, the disharmony, the pain. It gives you, it teaches you so much about yourself. And with that insight in how to avoid that suffering, those disturbances, those kinds of pain. You pour oil, a wave, disharmony. When you act, react, you put, you put, you make the wave worse. But if you, if you contemplate on what is happening, see it for what it is, a disruption, you pour oil on the wave, the wave becomes smaller. In the end, any kind of any kind of sense, feeling of dissatisfaction, of disturbance, of slightest bit of anger or any kind of emotion, technically it's a disharmony. It is a pain, considering considered here in the text. So how does Hatha Yoga help with that? Because it cultivates that consciousness in you that allows you to see the law of cause and effect at work. It gives you all the tools you need to go beyond ego, understand emotions, and instead of acting, reacting on it, learning something from it so that you grow and mature, evolve. 
pleasant side effect is that out of those one million lives that you are supposed to live as an ignorant being, you reduce the amount of reincarnations that you have to suffer through. Questions? I really like the visualization of the tortoise that supports the world. I'm a tortoise. You know the story of the tortoise and the, the hare and the turtle? I'm a tortoise. I'm a late bloomer. But that's a good thing. Tortoise is very slow, but steady. The hare is always in a rush, always in a hurry, but never getting anywhere. Be like a tortoise. Patience is one of the greatest virtues. I know from experience I've achieved everything through patience. And I learned patience in a very tragic way as a child. I turned lemons into lemonade. I told you when, when our Korean Hapkido teacher left Amsterdam in the late 1980s, all my Hapkido buddies, within one year, they all came to Korea to practice more. And I was jealous, I was sad, I was frustrated. They just did it. At that time, I didn't understand that my mindset, because of yoga, totally different. Because I thought, if I go, I have a goal. And I want to achieve that goal. And that means I have to be able to at least stay there for two years, if not more. So I started to prepare for that. They came. And they left and just went back to their old life. I totally transformed. And every next step <laughs> takes many years. And the last step that I manifested that I realized recently, I thought I was going to die. Really. But then it just came. And it's a vision that I had 30 years ago that is manifesting, that is realizing. People have never understood what the hell am I doing. You just leave everything behind. And the worst thing, people thought that I gave up my nationality. I have always believed that whatever happens, I will not have to depend on the government to take care of me. It's a vision. Mentally, you have doubt. In the crown chakra, you have no doubt. You have a confidence in your crown chakra that borders arrogance. If you move around spiritual circles, you will actually, if you don't understand it, you will actually think that many people are arrogant there. Have you experienced that? And of course, some of them are. <laughs> but having deep faith borders on arrogance. <clears throat> I always do the opposite of what people think is good for me. I was kind of burned out. First physically in 2017 and then mentally end of 2018. So I canceled the classes. I had no income. Didn't know what would happen. Actually I was 
I think I told you at the beginning of the course, at that time I really felt I'm done with yoga. I'm a, I'm a fake, lousy, horrible yoga teacher. I failed. I made the wrong choices in my life. I'm done. Instead of going back to Holland or trying to get a job, I adopted a dog, which I know was sent to me by those that move around the universe. You just know. For 20 years you don't want to have a dog. My previous dog just came to me in the same way. And when she died, I, I vowed never to have a dog anymore. Her death was so painful. And there he is, wandering around the park, not in the universe, but in the park. And I looked him in his eyes and I knew that he was there for me. People then think that I helped him, but he helped me. He inspired me to start teaching yoga again. He kept my feet on the ground and, and, and kept me going. Waking up in the morning with a purpose to make him, to go out and make him walk and, and, and help him to become stable. It took me one year. Him and his sister took me one year. If I look back, I think, how, the, how, how did I... How did I do? But it's all guided. It's a little bit difficult to explain, but follow your heart and they will take care of the rest. It sounds foolish, naive, even stupid. And sometimes in your deepest moments of desperation, you, you think you were. I, I did think about how stupid I must have been. But then everything, all the dots connected. <laughs> it was a big relief. <laughs> and, and it made me come to the conclusion that not, don't give up, ever. Because the things that I've done, I know people who have tried the same and they gave up. The moment things do not go smooth, the moment people lose something, go the same things go a little bit wrong, out of fear they give up. I never gave up. I hope you will never give up, whatever it is. And in your deepest desperation, think of this. The moment that you're really down on your luck, just sit down and rationalize. Think about, today I'm miserable and I want to die. But time will pass. Next year, it will be very different from now. It cannot remain the same. Then what do you do? Focus on practical things, your daily Go to the supermarket to get food, cook, clean your house. And if there is a needy dog that comes across your path, heed the call. It gives you purpose. <laughs> it's become a full-time job now. But the universe takes care of that too. I get paid in an indirect way. Patience and never give up. Okay, let's have a short break. <laughs>